My guest today is Kevin Gross de Klaus. Kevin, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to have you here. It's been a while since you've been on my show. And uh, what have you been up to recently? I have been busy at work, and uh, honestly, I won't lie, I just came back from a week uh, on a beach in Mexico. So well, I that appreciate sounds pretty you. Pretty darned awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I almost, uh, I know you and I pushed this recording back a little bit. I almost did it from the beach just so I could be on video there, but I was a little worried about the uh, internet connection. <laughs> well, you're doing it from the bar now. Uh, yeah. That's I, even better. So I'm in my basement. All over. Yeah. <laughs> we can grab something off the shelf behind you. Yep. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were talking about uh, you're becoming more and more, uh, you're, you're liking more and more of this low code, no code solutions. And you're using them more and more. Isn't that right? That is exactly right. So I am. A, my background is as a developer. So I, I don't come at those solutions as a citizen developer or as you know somebody who isn't technical to begin with and is trying to get more technical. I run a software development company. is my day job, and we we write large .NET, Azure, Angular, Cosmos, SQL, Kubernetes, you, you, the buzzwords of your traditional technology yeah, A lot stack. of high code stuff in there. A lot of high code stuff. And, and everyone that works at our company, we're, they're experts in those things. And what, what I am seeing you know, if from my seat and also from talking to many customers is there's a lot of capabilities out there that have came a long way from what you might expect that you can use things like the Power Platform to get more done, you know, be more efficient, get more done in less time and save money. And that scares a lot of the uh, hardcore developer you know, background people like me, but the the older I've gotten, the more I've appreciated those things. So, uh, yeah. So, Power Platform is Microsoft's uh, kind of suite of low code, no code solutions. Give us a quick uh, elevator pitch as to what that is. Yeah, I mean, th there's other alternatives. You know, everyone has a competitor anymore, but in the Microsoft space, you know, that the low code, no code term would generally equate to the that what they call their Power Platform, which is a, a suite of different offerings, uh, power applications, power apps, uh, where you build a build an application and there's a number of ways of doing that. They have Power BI, which is their reporting solution. Uh, they have Power Automate, which is more of a, a cloud-based like workflow, kind of a, a flow chart diagram, automate a process within your business. They have others like, uh, they have a, a relatively newer offering called Power Pages. They have Power Virtual Agents, if you want to uh, do more chatbot type things and build uh, powerful chatbots that can integrate into a number of tools. So the power platform is a, a broader marketing term for a bunch of things that fall under it. And a lot of times as we use this stuff, we use, you know, we rarely use one or the other. We're picking two or three of these things. And honestly, when we build very complex solutions, these, the power platform becomes a piece of a larger architecture. So it's not an all or nothing. Like you're going to go use the power platform or you're going to go build a .NET application or whatever you're your development, you know, stack of choices. A lot of times we're doing a power application for some features and we're doing an Angular application over here, hitting a you know, .NET API, .NET standard API to do something that this platform doesn't do. So again, I come at it with development backgrounds where I know there's limitations and we can overcome those limitations. But if I can get 90% of it done in a week and then, you know, spend a month doing the other 10, I'm still overall at a shorter project and less money spent. So. Yeah, this this has been one of the challenges with uh, some of these low code, no code approaches is that they're great for spinning up something that's really simple, but when you want to extend it or modify it, then uh, that's uh, then you kind of hit a wall. You have to. We, I've been in that case situation where I end up rewriting the thing. Yeah, and, and I think that scares a lot of developers. Yeah, that scares a lot of developers. They're like, hey, it doesn't do everything that the customer is going to want, so I I have to. I'd rather just custom build something from the beginning and not worry about even going down this path. Um, but the evolution of technology, we've seen this with chat GPT. I mean, there's crazy technologies coming out in, in the last couple of years that have changed the way we might look at how we build things. But, but this goes a long way, a lot farther than you, most. You know, it's not for everybody. There's not every application. When, you, when a customer comes to our company and says, I need this problem solved, uh, we, we, this is part of our toolbox. And that's about the best I could say it. It's a part of our toolbox I wish we went back to and considered more. Um, and beyond even the power platform, we consider um, full-fledged business applications like Microsoft Dynamics 365 and all of the capability. Dynamics is actually built on top of the power platform. So 
Um, if somebody is already using Dynamics, we can customize their Dynamics using the same power platform technologies that we're familiar with. So we can mix and match these, but the reality is that people you know, come to these solutions and Microsoft has came so far with what they do and for the scenarios where they fit. And it's gen and in a broader sense, the, the biggest thing I could tell you, when does this fit? It's that these tools target more internal enterprise applications. You wouldn't build the next Twitter or the next social media platform using these. But if you've got a business that has 50 people in a division that are all entering data, and it's your typical, you know, scenario where they, they're searching data, they're, they're generating reports, they're, they've got grids or views of this data, and they need, you know, complex data entry. Uh, Power Platform's great for that. You know, these people all work for the same entity. It kind of licenses it. You know, the way Microsoft charges for this is per user or per app. So mm -hmm. you pay a small monthly fee for, and then obviously the time to build it. But even once you build it, I mean, you're paying something to have access to it. But that's really the reality for any type of application. If you built a large .NET app, you're paying somewhere for that thing to live in the cloud. Right. Uh, you're paying for Azure Compute or database storage or yeah. something like that. Yeah, so, even on premises, you're going to have to pay for the yeah. hardware and so maintain yeah. that hardware and so on. There's always ongoing cost. The the ongoing cost here. This is what I would call uh, serverless, and I know it's not serverless, but that you know that's kind of the buzzword. You don't really care where it lives. You don't create a power app and say this is going to be in the central U.S. Azure data center. You just create a power app and you assign it to users. The database is the same way. the The power platform uses a database called Dataverse, or that's one of the primary databases you can actually create power bi reports are hitting pretty much you know a wide variety of databases oracle sql server cosmos it doesn't really limit you but they also come with their own database called dataverse which is an entity database basically just hidden behind an api you don't know where it lives you you can go configure it online you can create entities relationships forms charts dashboards uh and then it lives somewhere in a data center i mean i'm smart enough to know that but I don't really specify and don't give it any guidance. It just it's there, and I can create apps and reports against it. Yeah, that that application you described here, where we're we're saving some data somewhere, we're getting retrieving that data, presenting to the user in some way, whether that's a report or on screen. That's that's like seventy five, maybe ninety percent of the applications I've written in my yeah, career. Yeah, a lot of apps. And Microsoft has solved a lot of problems that every, everybody wants to, if they see data on a screen, they want to export it to Excel. They want to integrate with Office. They want to integrate with Teams. Power Apps, the Power Platform is very integrated with all these tools. You see something on screen, you can export it to Excel. You can import from Excel. There's all kinds of great interoperability or inter interaction and integration between you know apps built on that. It's a Microsoft suite of, of capabilities, right? So they, they've integrated it tightly with their own you know, office, you know, business user applications, Excel, and things of that nature. So it's it's actually very cool. And for the people that are already in that ecosystem, it just makes sense that we consider that as part of, I'm going to build you an application or automate a process. You know, I can reach out to your Office 365 and it doesn't even have to be an app that someone sees. It, the, what you can automate is crazy. Yeah, you can say, hey, when an email lands in this inbox, you know, open it up and ask for approval from this person and save the document to this, you know, OneDrive folder, all kinds of crazy automation to where we're seeing smaller businesses that might have never considered automating processes. They, they look at a company like ours or that many like ours that, you know, a whole team of developers and product owners and testers, what would it take to really write a custom solution? And it's probably beyond the budget of many smaller businesses. So they just get away by doing things manually and they go for years doing things manually until they, they get enough revenue where it makes sense to automate it. With the Power Platform, I can look at these smaller businesses and say, hey, this could be a two-day you know, engagement for us to go in and automate, and we'll save you all the errors and all the time and you know, hours of work a week, and it's really not that expensive because we're just using these tools that are built for it, and you're yeah, off that, to the races. That's really a, a, a big hindrance to a lot of really small companies is that they don't want to build an enterprise app because the, the upfront cost of actually hiring developers oh, yeah. is, is prohibitive. But knocking that down is a lot. And, I, and my experience is that customers, by and large, have they don't care at all about the technology behind it. They don't care about all about the tools or how it's created. They care about their business problem, whether or not it solves their business problem. Um, and there, but, there but are some not, customers that do. Uh, some customers well, have the need. So actually, I was going to think that you are a user of this, and you probably care because you're a technologist. You came up as a developer. And uh, and yet you've been you're buying into these these kind of rapid application development tools. What what yeah, sold you on it? 
Well, I came up as a developer, definitely, but what sold me on it 100% is my career transition into business owner and more sales. I'm the guy that goes out and, and engages with potential customers and talks to them about solving their problems. My company that I own also uses these tools to automate our own processes. So when it, it's one thing for a developer to make a decision on what technology to use when it's someone else's money. And I didn't appreciate that in my youth, right? So as I've gotten older and it's, it's my company's bottom line that is hit, if I spend eight months automating a process, I evaluate is eight months of a development team working on this, is it, or could I just, you know, I could almost hire someone, you know, part time to go do that manually. And developers don't ever think about that when you're, when you're just kind of building. So with Power Platform, I can get a lot more done a lot cheaper and I appreciate that. And again, it's not for everything, but it is something that I consider and I consider, I want my teams to be efficient. I, I'm, there's still scenarios. And your point earlier about, you know, most businesses don't care about the technology. Certain subset do uh, at scale if you're big enough. I mean, if you're just a, you've got a thousand developers, you don't want everyone off to the, you know, in their own little niche doing something. You care about some consistency and some standards. Small, medium sized businesses that really get value out of this, they just want value. They really don't care. They don't even understand. I could tell them 10 different technologies and they would say, You're the expert. You tell me. Um, I've never custom built a house myself, but I know a lot of people that have. Uh, and if somebody came out and told me this is a better building, you know, a product than this, I would just take their word for it. I don't sure. really know. I don't have the background in that space to... I'm like that with my auto mechanic. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm the same way. I'm not a car guy. So if they tell me something, I do a little research, maybe ask a friend or two, but that's about as far as I go. I'm not going to... I rarely ever come back and say, I think, you know, you're absolutely just feeding me a, a line here. So technology is that way for most of our customers until you hit a certain size. And then they really do care. The technology has to fit this, you know, the, it has to be the square peg and everything has to fit in that square peg. But even those companies at size are starting to have whole divisions that just build stuff with this because not every application needs to fit in that. If they're just solving a problem for 20 people in marketing to better inner data, they may just go create a power app and do that and not even bother. So I think this is also solving the development issue of most, even big companies, just don't have enough developers in, you know, to provide the level of features and the, and the development capacity to get all the work done. So yeah, at some point, I, you get more work done. True. I, I, I have um, worked in some of these big companies as a consultant, and I have discovered that there's a whole process of asking the IT department to create something for you. And yeah. sometimes that takes months. And oh, yeah. Say, I just want this little form that's going to... And so they have these little skunk work projects developed. They just, oh, just store it all in an Excel spreadsheet or a Lotus Notes database or something like that off to the yeah. side. And uh, this, this technology definitely would empower those departments, which is there a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon your yeah. perspective. And there's, there's still, I mean, I guess the developer in me thinks it's very worth, much worth pointing out that there's still governance, there's still security. All those things are baked into the platform. You can limit who has access to publish apps or limit what data these apps have access to or limit the users that, have, that can get in there. So all of those things are just baked into the platform. That we would have to build that manually if we were custom mm -hmm. writing code. But it's not like it's the Wild West. Now, some companies that we've worked with have kind of, made it the wild west by not considering that governance and just letting everyone in their organization go build stuff but if if you do think about those things which are worth thinking about and i think everyone should there are ways of achieving that and it's actually very powerful and very very easy to get you know wrap your arms around it make sure that everyone's not just going off you know in some different direction at their standards that are adhered to that actually sounds really compelling compared to the, uh, the world i described with excel spreadsheets and access apps and uh, uh, I, I know notes databases aren't much of a thing anymore <laughs> but uh, but still they're out there they're still out there in the world in the wild you um, and me remember those days when that was yeah wild. yeah absolutely companies yeah. did that our departments did yeah. that all the time because they just I, I can't wait months for david and it to build this thing for me i need it tomorrow <laughs> yeah I mean, I guess a really good case study and, and i've actually talked about this at a few conferences very specific to this one Many, many, a year, year or two ago when uh, the first COVID vaccinations were just released and just the first couple vendors were on the market and it was only available to people above a certain age or with a pre-existing condition. Uh, here in St. Louis, we had five or six hospitals and healthcare organizations get together and start to pool. They were given so many doses and they said, we should pool our doses and we should host events in underserved parts of our city 
mm-hmm. and we should just give these away. Every weekend, we should just get all our nurses to volunteer and go give away as many of these and get them in arms of people so that we can you know, do good for our community. So they, they started to think about that, and they thought it's all great, but what we don't have an easy way of doing is tracking it because there are there are restrictions every time you in to this day when you get a covid shot it has to be reported to your state there's a dose number on it you have to track what nurse gave it to you there's just some data tracking information they couldn't just go out there and just take them all out of a box and put them in someone's arm it had to be tracked so they didn't have a system in place to do this um each or a few of the hospitals were big enough they had a system that might support it but they weren't allowed from a security standpoint to let their competitors at other hospitals use their software. So uh, they reached they reached out to us and they wanted to start in like two weeks. And they said, we need a data, we need to solve this data problem. If we could do this, how fast could you do it? And in a traditional development space, you know, I'm looking at eight months, you know, I got to gather requirements, I got to jump through hoops, I got to engage teams, I got to provision Azure infrastructure. But, but, but people were dying, you did something yeah. fast. Yeah, and they're like, we need it two weeks because I got nurses, we could get enough volunteers to give 5,000 doses away. Yeah, and those know, doses days go bad. They, they go they, bad, so, you know, yeah. and they're getting more. So what we did is uh, a couple people at my company, we did put together, a, a so it wasn't 100% power platform. We built a small registration site in Angular and .NET, hosted Beautiful. in Azure for people just to register. And then everything else was Dynamics for just the CRM of tracking. All, when you registered online, it went into Dynamics. There was no database, no traditional database. And then we created for on, once you showed up, you registered for a time slot, you got on prem, you went and checked in and the people at check in had an iPad and that iPad was running a power app that was native. We didn't have to go through the app store. We didn't have to do any of the stuff to get a native app. We just used the power apps app on an iPad. This is all mobile friendly. And they checked in. They said, great, you're here on time. Go back to this nursing station. They sat down. A nurse administered the dose and a, a, what they called a scribe, a, another nurse that was sitting there, just collected the data and said, this person sat at this table and got this dose at this time. And then at the end, we had a Power BI report that went up to the state to report it. And we were done in four or five days. We had a week of testing in awesome. wow. a two-week project to solve a problem. And I actually went to a bunch of these personally and sat on site. And if they found a bug or they had a feature, I was able to make the change right there, hit save, and have them refresh on their iPad. So I stood at registration, and if somebody couldn't check in, I could change the app in real time, tell them, hit save, and have them refresh, which in my career, I've never been able to have that much of a direct impact that quickly on a, on a business problem. I guess I've, in my life, I've never been involved in that type of situation either, but um, in terms of technology, it was very efficient. And then in the end, we didn't invest that much time in it, and once... The, you know, more people got into that space and now more people are vaccinated. The application just isn't used anymore. We turned everything off, archived it, and now it's done. So we, again, we didn't invest millions for something that was only going to be used for 12 months. Talk about so, banging for your buck. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And something that with uh, just a couple of weeks of work had a huge impact on the community. Yeah. And it was, it was more than I, it was probably the biggest app I've built, even though it wasn't that huge, but it was the biggest power app at the time that I had built two years ago. We've done more since, but it was, it opened my eyes to why it's worth considering alternative, you know, solutions than just break out Visual Studio Code, you know, create a .NET new project and go. So. Uh, yeah, we've sort of conditioned ourselves <laughs> to a certain we way of building applications and breaking yeah. that paradigm, breaking that, that the muscle memory. It's a challenge sometimes. And even in my own company, I do lunch and learns, and I really evangelize it from the top down. Uh, I've got a, you know, I work with some great, great developers and some great architects and everyone else, and they, they, they're still, for the most part, in that muscle memory. Day in and day out, they're building very large, complex things for, you know, m- huge companies that do need maybe some of those tools, but we're starting to piece in the Power Platform stuff, too, and say, hey, we don't need to build a back-end admin thing. You can do that all in a Power App. As opposed to if only five users internally are going to use these 20 screens, let's do that in a power app in a week. And then you guys focus your hardcore development on the public facing front end stuff. And so we're trying to figure out where that dial is on a project to save people money. Kevin, yeah, well, this is a great conversation. I've, I've talked with, uh, on this show about power apps before, but we talked more on the technology side. I love that we're focusing on the business value side here. Yeah. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you feel is important to get out? Um, I, I don't think there is. Uh, I mean, again, it's, I think I told you this, you know, coming into this conversation, 
I know that the marketing materials and the websites that you see from Microsoft and others really promote the technologies from a citizen developer and like people that are new to technology. I come at it much different. I've not really seen, in my experience, I have yet to come across a scenario where somebody that did not have a pretty deep technical background adopted these. I'm not saying they're not out there. I mean, people have a bigger purview of the world than me, but um, all the people that I've seen adopt this suite of capabilities it, it specifically in the Microsoft space were people that, that can't come at this from a development frame of mind to begin with. So, and I think that's always been very successful. I, I give talks at conferences and most of the audience, 99% of the audience is developers deciding how this would fit into maybe upcoming projects. I've rarely even spoken to someone that does isn't a developer. So. Are you doing any speaking in the near future? Um, I don't have anything coming up. Uh, our conference okay. here in St. Louis is later. Uh, I unfortunately had a busy travel schedule in the in the fall. Uh, it was good running into you and it Code Mash. A shout that out to Code Mash and Sandusky. Right? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, I'll see you. Maybe I'll see you at DevUp. I'm not sure. Well, uh, I saw that I got an email today about the CFPs opening up. But yep. uh, it was great so, talking to you. Okay. you. Stay safe. Great. You as well. I appreciate you having me on. Always fun. And eventually, I do hope that at one of the technologies we talked about here will be used by my developer friends. <laughs>